Because all of these boards were designed as low cost boards. And when you do a low cost design, there are several things that get traded off. First of all, most of these boards are designed to operate with a wall board. And when you do that, you basically, the engineers are looking at it saying, we don't have to optimize all of these pieces uh, and make it easy for the people to do power measurements. In addition, they also oftentimes throw out test points in which you can do the measurements. So there's a lot of things that these low cost boards uh, create problems when you're trying to do good measurements. What we want to start off with is, uh, I'm not going to try to go to uh, the hardware side here, but I wanted to, to introduce you to Ohm's Law. I don't know how many people have an electrical engineering background, but basically what we're looking at is uh, the formula in order for us to calculate voltage, current, or resistance. And as long as we have two of these device, uh, two of these pieces of information, we can make the calculation and determine uh, the third. An example of what we're talking about is if we measured a voltage of uh, uh, zero, a 0 0.015, 175 volts, and we were measuring it across a shunt resistor of 0 0.05 ohms, we could make the determination that this device was actually consuming about 350 milliamps. With that in mind, we can use a shunt resistor which is a very low resistance resistor and very accurate. So the more accurate that we can get the actual resistor, we know it's actually right at 0 0.05 or even smaller 0 0.01. I don't know if uh, any of you have looked at uh, uh, resistor values, but they actually come in a percentage of tolerance. You can have 1%, 5%, 10%. So the shunt resistors that we're talking about using for, for uh, uh, power measurements and such are usually very accurate. They're in the 0.1% range, so they're very, very accurate. Uh, they're generally very low resistance to not impede uh, the uh, actual voltage on the board, so they're very, very low. And they come in all different sizes, of course. Uh, they come in as small as uh, uh, 0201 all, uh, package all the way up to through hole components. You'll need to place one of these on your power rail so that you can do some power measurements. And you have the option of cutting traces, which is pretty invasive to the board. You can also lift pins off your power rails. That's pretty invasive too. Or you can replace parts. Now one of the common things uh, on most designs. This is a, a picture of a schematic for the Pandem board. And I did a sampling of quite a few of the development boards. And most of the power management chips that we're talking about will have what looks to be an inductor before the power rail coming in. So, and this is a primary spot for you to work with and test. All of these are all marked as inductors, but if you actually look at the part number indicated, it's actually a ferrite bead. And what that does is basically for filtering of high frequency noise. Now, generally for a development board being used in a rough environment, you know, on your desk, the ferrite bead works really well for filtering. But if we're talking about doing power measurement tests in a controlled area, or uh, some such of uh, a group where you're looking at these in a very isolated area, you can actually remove this ferrite bead and it provides a prime location to replace it with a shunt resistor. Uh, basically, uh, most of these packages are 602s or 805s. Uh, there are some 1210s, but you can order these uh, shunt resistors and basically desolder that shunt uh, or the in ferrite bead and replace it with the shunt resistor. If you're using the, if you make this change to your board and you're using it on a static map, is that kind of enough to ensure? More than enough. Most of the engineers that I talk to that do these types of designs, they try to go overboard with noise filtering on the power wheels. 
the problem is that, well, it's not really a problem, it's the fact that most of these PMIX, like for instance the TWL 6030, have internal filtering that, that's very, very good. And I did, like, again, I did a sampling of uh, Panda, Snowball, uh, Quick Start. All of them had ferrite beads in certain locations that you can work with. And based on the data sheets and things that I looked at, and I actually consulted a number of, uh, of the core engineers for the 6030, and they felt that, that, the, that the ferrite bead was more of a safety precaution as far as uh, making sure that, you know, if you have a cell phone, you've got, uh, uh, you know, uh, packed in there, you got all the components closely together and everything, but for the development board, most of them are fairly well spaced out and it's not that big of a deal. So you can see each one of the core voltages actually has a ferrite D that can be replaced, and so you can monitor each one of those rails. The problem uh, that we look at when we actually start measuring shunt resistors at such small voltages that we want to monitor. The problem is they're so small that if we're connecting them to an analog to digital converter or even on some multimeters, the voltage is too small to accurately measure. To make sure that we can actually measure it and uh, use the current tools that we have, you need to connect up what's called an op amp. And basically an op amp is an operational amplifier. You have uh, a positive and a negative lead that we uh, connect across the shunt resistor. In order to adjust the scaling of the voltage, for instance, uh, if you wanted to measure it and multiply it up by 100, so that if you had measured one volt, instead it would multiply it and create 10 volts, you would need to use some resistors on each side of the op amp in order to adjust that scaling. And there's a formula that you use to, to adjust that. Just like we were talking about on the shunt resistors, most resistors have a tolerance. You can get 1% resistors, 5, 10%, 20%. When you're using the op amp, it's very important that the tolerances for these resistors are very accurate or you don't get a true scale. For instance, uh, with uh, resistors that aren't very tolerant, or uh, out of tolerance, uh, you could actually have a multiplication of uh, 105 or 102.3, so you don't get an accurate scale. So even adding the resistors and soldering, they, they can, you can get uh, an odd value. That's where, after much experimentation and Googling around, I actually stumbled across this TI part that nobody advertises. You cannot find anything on the TI side about this particular part, but it is specifically designed for this application, including actually in the documentation, it actually has the shunt resist resistor as an example. The INA199 parts actually has internal precision resistors already built into the chip. And you can buy it in pre-configured uh, 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 chip configurations. You can get either 50, a multiplication of 50, 100, or 200. And almost every, I checked DigiKey, Mauser, uh, Barnell, everyone carries these in stock. And it's a perfect little device uh, for using what we need to do. Now, that's just some background of what we needed to do. We need to, to modify the board, put a shunt resistor in. We need to measure the voltages and do something with them. So, my original design, I pulled uh, an Adreno Nano. Uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with this. It's a uh, small AVR board. Uh, it has a USB to RS-232 adapter built onto the board, so it has a mini USB jack. Uh, it has uh, your digital and analog pins on here. Uh, it has a programming header. It's very, very easy to use. Uh, it comes with an ISP header, which is basically an in-system programmer. Now, the, uh, you can buy this off the shelf from several different vendors. It usually goes anywhere from $18 to around $30, depending on what options and things you get with it. 
So this is what I used for my initial testing, and uh, I just wrote a small application, and I connected up uh, uh, some INA 199s. I monitored three power rails, and I wrote an application that basically uh, samples the analog to digital converter for each one of the rails, and then outputs the sampled value by the mini USB jack to uh, a UART uh, connection to your host PC. The initial test that I did was just logging the values, and then I did any of the calculations that I needed to convert from the sampled voltage to uh, current. Uh, I did those on the host PC. Some of the advantage of this particular device is that it is low cost. There's plenty of uh, places that you can purchase different types of components for this particular board. There are literally thousands of open source tools to work with this. Uh, uh, ABR GCC allows you to compile your application to put on here and configure it. However, the, the maximum clock frequency and the analog digital converters on this device are not the best options available for doing some detailed comparison. It was enough for what we were looking at to, to capture, but if I would really want to start doing some detailed work, it's probably not the best choice. Coming from TI, I was pushed pretty hard to use the MSB430. Uh, it is extremely low cost. I mean, very, very low cost. Uh, uh, in bulk quantity, if I wanted to build a thousand uh, of these uh, devices that we're talking about, I probably could get the MSP430 in a sub $1 package. Uh, it has very good analog and digital converters. Uh, the, the jitter control and things like that are, are very good on it, and it's just incredible for the cost. The major problem is limited tools on the open source side. TI has been uh, reticent to actually work with a lot of the community to help make these tools available. The progressing, the launch pad board that you see here was uh, actually introduced last year, and the open source community has been working on it, but it's nowhere near the compatibility of the AVRs. The other option is the NXP LPC series. It's actually an ARM device, ARM uh, 7 uh, TDMI. And so this particular device actually adds an interesting twist because those of you who do ARM development currently can use your existing tool chain to compile and work with this particular device without having to worry about any major changes. It has relatively good analog to digital converters. Uh, depending on which version that you get, you can get as much as uh, 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 14 analog to digital converters actually on the board with the average one having six. However, the cost of the chip itself is relatively high compared to the two previous devices. Uh, the LPC2148 generally in bulk quantity is going to cost you about $10. But when we're talking about this particular device, it adds a lot of robustness to it. Much higher clock frequency, which means we can sample more often. It has really good A to D uh, uh, conversion that we talked about. Plus, it has a really good support system because most of uh, the people that we're targeting for this particular design already have the tool chain to start tinkering and working with. So, uh, this is probably where I'm going to go with the design. But again, after the uh, presentation here, I'd love some feedback and discussion as far as the pros and cons on this particular option. The last portion of this particular design uh, that we need to, to discuss and talk about is the data protocol. Originally on my Atmel AVR design, I was simply transferring uh, ASCII characters to describe the, uh, uh, the voltage as it was sampled. But with this in mind, if I really want to do a lot of sampling very quickly to, to catch transitions for OVD from different layers, things like that, I need a much faster uh, way of doing it. And so uh, that transfer rate is very important. So there are some protocol things that uh, I've been looking at that are existing with things, for instance, open source logic analyzers and open source oscilloscopes 
have a, a protocol that uh, they have mapped out for transferring sample values. So what we need to do is really uh, begin a discussion on whether we want to use one of the existing protocols, develop our own for power manage measurements. Uh, uh, another portion is how to timestamp these values as compared to your testing that you're working with. How do you know that uh, uh, I've uh, issued uh, the sequence to transition from one of, uh, OPP to another? How do I tie that to the actual values as I see it? Do I see a pipe, uh, spike uh, you know, uh, 20 milliseconds after I do the transition? Uh, so the timestamp is going to be fairly important. And the other problem that I did was I did a lot of logging. I, I stored the values, so the, the values were not necessarily real time. They were meant to be looked at after you did the, the, the capture. Some of the people that I talked to want real time. They want to view it as it's happening. They want to have uh, something that they can look at the values as they type in commands and tinker with it. Other people are more interested in logging it as a part of an automated test and making sure that some highs and lows are met during a particular uh, sequence of testing. So there's a combination that we may need to look at as far as that goes. And then of course, uh, some sort of PC client so that we can look at these, uh, whether it uh, is some sort of uh, real-time graph. Uh, you know, I'm not much of a user space, so most of the time I, I'm just capping this to a file and that type of thing. So, uh, what we need to look at is in the future having some sort of tool that we can view these graphically, whether that's some uh, existing mathematics tool from open source or whether we have to write something specific for it. I don't know at this time. Again, this is, uh, the whole presentation here is trying to get some good feedback from you guys. So, to summarize what we're looking at, um, challenges, we got to on the board that we're going to do these power measurement tests it is going to require somebody get a soldering iron to it. Uh, whether that will change in the future, whether the NARL can have influence on its members and say, if you're going to release a community board, we need to have these uh, test points as part of your requirements to make sure that we can do automated testing, or whether uh, some sort of committee or joint venture happens, I don't know. But uh, definitely, uh, uh, Lenora has a, a force of doing these types of testing that can influence future development boards. Uh, as a note on my part, I've begun pushing very strongly for future TI uh, boards to have at least three shunt resistors on the board so that you can isolate four features. Um, of course, I will have to do that battle in inside TI itself, uh, cost uh, versus benefit analysis and that kind of thing, but that is my goal based on these experiences. Uh, op amps, uh, there are probably other op amps out there besides the TI ones that are available. Uh, I recently talked to somebody at ELC, uh, just recently in Prague. Uh, they said there are a couple combination op amps analog digital converters that are I2C based that you can actually connect to uh, devices and do your measurements that way as well. So those are some items that I want to research. Uh, so again, these are some of the core challenges that we look at with the development boards. And then to summarize, we need to, to basically look at the trade-offs. If we use something like the uh, ARM7 um, NXP device, our dongles are probably going to cost in the $60 to $80 range after we do production and, and everything. But if we go through something like an ABR, you're dropping that cost down to the $30 range. So there's definitely costs involved. We also have to consider the tools, whether we want to use something like ARM tool change and versus ARM G, uh, GCC, or ABR GCC. And of course, the features like the analog to digital converters and then in the future we'll talk about how do we want to actually work with this data. Questions? Discussion? Are there uh, other limits <coughs> like then that voltage and like can I get the uh, you know high voltages when the board is active and then also detect the sub low uh, voltages when it's in like some of our That's the uh, the catch. You definitely want to make sure that the min and max are uh, 
uh, generally to a range where the 10 bits that you have available can capture it. If you suspect that you're actually going to have two separate groups of where you may have uh, very low ranges during one particular time and very high ranges in another time, actually connect up two sets of op amps to the same shunt resistor. And so one set of op amps may be multiplied at a uh, much lower rate, uh, say 50, and the second set multiplied at 200 and use two separate analog to digital converters. So uh, most of the, the devices that we just discussed have anywhere from 6 to 24 analog to digital converters available. So really, it, if you know that you're going to have it, the best way is just to connect up that, an additional analog to digital. I think that'll probably be pretty common for us. Yeah. I'm sorry, can you repeat that back? on the shunt resistor. The shunt resistor will have a wattage rating as well. So you definitely want to get the correct size of uh, the shunt resistor. If, if you place it on uh, a line that you expect to have as much as one amp, you'll need to do the math to actually make sure that the shunt resistor is available. Uh, when, you're, when you're measuring it, it's all, uh, it's all about the voltage. You're not actually measuring the current. So uh, you're doing it uh, uh, slightly different than, than what you would be worrying about on, say, uh, you know, a 20 watt resistor and, and things like that. So it's all about measuring voltage, not the actual current, and doing the math to find the current. Did I answer what you were asking? that I didn't make the calculations directly in the ABR on my design. I just reported the voltage values. That way, on the PC side, I can actually go, go through and, and write the code and say, all right, I'm using a .05 resistor. Go ahead and do the math. And uh, if we're talking about doing a client to report these values, we might just have a configuration file that says, you know, uh, this is our multiple range where our amp is multiplied by 100, and uh, the shunt resistor that we're using is a 0.015 or, or 0.05, and it would take that configuration file and do math for you. So, uh, you're you're not the open source of the software that runs on the chip. Absolutely. Yeah. So we could potentially put make it easy for someone to. Reprogram, yeah, the, the problem is that if, if you do that, they do have to reprogram it. Yeah. And so, but if, if you do it in such a way on the protocol that it just reports the voltage and do the math on your on the PC side, it's a lot easier for again, like a software developer to make the change on the PC side. Replace these. 
it's, it's a fairly easy deal. But, but the question is, um, as a long-term deal, uh, Lenora, I, I assume everybody in Lenora wants to be here in the next five years. Now is the time to start making sure and talking to the, the companies to make sure that they add. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a huge uh, implementation. No, but we have, I mean, we have worked hard on some other issues where we require specific types of implementation. Right. And uh, so we worked over the last year to get those meetings to do that. Some of them have been sort of in the Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, from my perspective, one validation, and we fully buy a dozen of some calls. Right. And so we pay your home to qualify. Rather than just sort of feed it back, if in some acceptable form this could be a part of the charter that the power management working group has, that it's not a mandate, it's a request to the partnership yeah, yeah. saying that think about this. We have that request in the other forms for the other areas, not every. Yeah, but and, and perhaps it. it should be that. Yeah. Right? You can simply make it the carrot and horse type deal uh, in the aspect that, you know, you say, yes, we will get to testing your board. But there's other boards that already have these on here, and because it makes it easy for us to do those tests first, that's yeah. the Because your board does not have them, that means we have to send it out to be modified, so y'all get put at the bottom of the, of the stack. So there, you know, like, there's some incentives that you can, you can do with that. Yeah. And uh, I've already made that case with TI, and I think based on what I'm getting feedback, they're acceptable with that. So, uh, in future community boards from, from TI, those at least one and probably three shot resistors would be popular. So, and if you use the old solution, uh, which has a certain uh, parameters, um, I mean, you said that we're at the 60 dollar range solution. 60 to 80, depending on what we do right. as far as features and things like that. But, uh, once I get the primary section, I'm sorry, I didn't mean Once I get the primary section down as far as what we want to do and make sure all of those goes then I'll go back and revisit to make sure that we can actually do other things. For instance, buying this for power management might not be the only tool that you could use this for. So the multi-use item is what we want to do is about to make a lot of appeal to it. So do you anticipate them to be uh, add on or add on top of the traditional low cost points? I don't see that ever happening because, uh, again, even if we do convince a lot of these manufacturers to uh, add shunt resistors, they're going to be in different places, they're going to be <coughs> different values, different types of connections. Uh, I don't see it as an item that's ever going to be standardized in that area. Most of the time you're, talk you're talking about using uh, uh, some sort of probes or connectivity to uh, plug in and, and wires for that specific, some sort of flying leads to go to it. Yeah, could we talk about some sort of standardization where we bring out all the trails to a... Uh, we, 
we just got to talk about how much it's going to begin to push a, a single shot resistor. I mean, this is not, this is a multi-step process. Yeah, to, to get to the point where we have some sort of specialized header for these types of measurements, uh, that would be a, like a decade long. We need an IEEE standard. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, it's all about, it's all about that. Just, just say that. Uh, there are several different variations of that LPC part, and the minimum would be six, and probably the maximum, based on the frequency and everything, would probably be 14. So are there, is, there's a trade-off for the uh, number of rails versus sampling rate? I mean, Correct, because uh, basically what you have is a single analog to digital converter, and what you're doing is uh, connecting it to each one of the pins in sequence. So, so what do you guys want to measure? I mean, the, the first thing that comes to my mind is we want to see DVFS transitions, and then you would also like to see clock gating. You know, even if it's a very short period of you know, clock enable disable, you guys can capture that. So, so one thing I, uh, I've been thinking about is uh, things like CPU audio transition that we see. Yeah. We want to be able to uh, map that to uh, the output that you get from first. So you were talking about uh, post-processing of the data and tools to do that. And uh, so kernel chart is, is one tool which we uh, use to see what's going on inside the kernel context, which is what's going on. And then there's a curve uh, set of tools. And that is where we're trying to take all this to where you can, you can correlate the power transitions to what's going on in the system. Right. At least at the kernel level, I don't know how much we get into so what the timing uh, did you have you gotten a decent solution yet or are you still looking into it really? I, I haven't really gotten a decent solution. Again, this particular deal was done on a very short notice and it was just a uh, uh, research in, in the idea of what could be done. And so more or less what I'm uh, trying to give you is some, some feedback of of my uh, hack and what could have done that could be done better and give you a platform, a number of choices for platforms that we can make, and all of us start working on it together as far as a single uh, common uh, item, uh, instead of hacking up whatever we find. Well, there's like two solutions for the time standard problem. You can either have the development platform and the measurement platform can be baked with the standards, <coughs> or both of these can feed into a host and you let the host take care of the, of, uh, yeah, for the That seems more likely. Well, no, no, there's trade-offs, right? So if you have, if you do it on the host PC, you have a data connection between your dev platform and the host, which will impact your power. Uh, so like if your UART's active, you may not idle as often, especially if you're doing it over USB, then there's a big power draw there. One other way, uh, so, so if that's okay, if you're doing like some really active use case web browser measurements, not a big deal. But if you want to do like these low power idle state measurements, then maybe that will impact. And then you could also just run like a DPIO or something over from the dev platform to the you know the measurement platform and just have it fire off a start stop. You know, and, and that's another thing you, you could definitely do for like low power measurements. So what do you guys think? So I have some more questions. Sure, sure. Awesome. Um, the uh, oh go ahead, sorry. Right. We need uh, if we need to finish that one up, I'll make sure. No, I mean uh, I think uh, you're right about the fact that if we have to write over the network, that's going to impact uh, our measurements. And uh, we need to be able to buffer up things locally and then maybe batch it out if we need, I don't know, depending on the use case. And, and just to know, say, the uh, NXP part does have some, uh, some timers that are available as far, as far as that goes, as far as, as well as RTC. So there are some things that we could sync up between the host PC and that and do a lot of it. These are kind of questions you want to Exactly. Or not, I don't expect true answers right. at this stage, but uh, definitely uh, understand the limitations and what I'm looking at and maybe uh, create a wiki page either on Monaro stuff or on e Linux and, and kind of uh, back some of these ideas around. Um, so the AVR solution you said, it was, uh, I guess, had a lower frequency than the other solutions. So you're talking about 
the sampling rate going to be worse than that? I'm sorry, is the sampling rate going to be worse than the ADR solution? Is that what you did? Not correct, know? correct. Uh, it's not as, uh, as robust. Uh, basically, what I was getting down to was about, about one millisecond on the sampling time. Whereas, really, mathematically wise, on the ARM solution, we probably, again, I haven't implemented it, but based on the math, we could actually probably get down into the 100 nanosecond on a sampling rate on the end. Okay. So, there, because the clock frequency of the, the ARM is much higher. Uh, the ABR is actually running at 12. Uh, the NXP solution that I was using uh, to tinker with was running at 60 megahertz. So, big difference in the clock. Yeah. Another thought I have, because I've thought about this whole problem a lot too, and looked at a lot of different equipment out there. Um, for, for our purposes, for the most part, we could actually use some averaging on the analog side, and so the sampling rate doesn't have to be that fast to catch all the power. Um, you can still see like peaks averaged over like 100 nanoseconds or whatever, but um, every, the system is so dynamic that you're never going to catch everything that's going on unless you did some averaging on the analog side. Right. So I'm, I'm not sure if that's something that could be added to this or if that's kind of overkill. No, it, it can be done. Uh, there's actually most of the analog to digital converters in all three of the, the devices that we discussed have some features where you can actually set the average time and it will report an average time, uh, average value for you. So there's a lot of things that you can set and work with. Okay, I guess I was thinking more along the lines of an average, like an integrating op amp. Like it, it, I guess if it's averaging, the analog to digital converter is averaging, it's still taking a bunch of samples and just averaging them together. Correct. So I was, I was thinking about more of uh, some kind of op amp integrator. So I, I don't know if that even makes sense in this application, but um, I'm just want to throw it out there. It is, it is doable, um, but really at this stage, that that begins to be complicated dramatically. Okay. And, and almost exponentially in com complexity. So in, in really what we want to do is try to keep it to a minimal number of components and as many off-the-shelf components as possible. Yeah, so I think in that case then, I think the, the averaging and a the digital converter, then that's a good idea. So um, if, if you just keep those running averages and the data set back to post, is it so dependent on, on that, that bandwidth? Exactly. Yeah, but doesn't that get back to whether or not we want to I mean, do we want to see the transitions uh, more clearly, or do we just want to measure total energy? I think I think you want to see the transitions still. I, I think you could average in a small enough window to still see that very quickly. Let's say like a, a data over one microsecond average versus just putting you know every nanosecond of data you know over the line. Yeah, yeah, at microsecond level, that's fine. Would it make sense to kind of peak detector in there as well? Rather than averaging over a set window, you sort of detect it, get any. Um, yeah, well, well, for every for, within for each interval, you get the peak in the in that interval rather than the average. Yeah, that would be nice. Also, yeah. I don't know if that's built into any of those ADs that can do that on these programs. Not really for the peak detection, but uh, again, I mean, analog peak detectors are that hard to wire up. So, all of you guys are software engineers in this aspect. We can do anything that we want with software, uh, as long as you, we have the hardware in your hands to start tinkering with it. So well, what I was meaning, get it detecting peaks of shorter duration than the sampling interval, which of course would require some analog circuitry. It's all new.
understand we can also record the, as you mentioned, peak, but also record the, the lowest value as well. And that could help with some system debugging, even if you have, you know, if you have some hardware with a bad path. Right. Um, that would be a great way to take a cut on what the scope is. Exactly. Now, and this goes back to the data transfer protocol that I was talking about. Uh, we really need some sort of format to in the or API for this protocol so that we can transfer these types of information. Uh, maybe a, a format where uh, when you send the data to your host PC, you get something of the, uh, the average value, your your peak, your your, uh, your min value, uh, some sort of timestamp, uh, and the CRC. You know, so there's some things that we need to to, to, to go over. There are a couple open source logic analyzer applications and a couple uh, open source oscilloscope applications, and they're both using a very unified uh, protocol for transferring this data, and it's very similar. And what we're talking about is very similar to uh, a USB-based uh, oscilloscope. And one of the things, in the case I'm talking about, on the connection side, instead of measuring the voltage across the resistor, you have two points, and you're connected to those two points already. Right. Just measuring one of those points is relative to the ground, and that way you get that voltage, the minimum voltage depth there. Yeah, the, the problem with that is um, the once you go through the opting ups for that, it, it, it's a differential across it. So yeah, right, right. It, you right. Add, now you could use you could use another analog to digital converter, and but again that you start using up all of the ones that you have for different ranges and things like that. So. Uh, I, I was I was really surprised at how uh, the little quirks and things that were revolving around actually doing such a simple test and getting data it, it became complicated very very quickly. So uh, I don't want to derail your session, but I think it's probably worth discussing uh, some of the stuff that we were planning to share with the farm and the local farm members. So uh, you know, you, I think you kickstarted a very important part of the discussion, which is the instrumentation. Right. But an equally uh, compelling problem that we face internally, and I'm sure everybody else does, is how do you rope in the instrument and an external host and the target, and come up with some scaffolding that allows you to take a workload, run it in some sense to form the abstractions in place that allow you to sequence the, the run, right. get the data out, and perhaps store it in some sense to form. We've had a start of trying to come up with a, a framework that allows this to happen. And we'd like to share that with the power management working group. We've been having this discussion by our side. Perhaps it makes sense for us to have a discussion to see how we can take this and, and, and roll it into that flow. Because the design goal here was to keep it abstract enough to put in any instrument which sample would right. start first. So at the moment, uh, the ARM framework uh, allows you to plug in like an NI DAC. Right. I'm not an expert on that particular instrument that the you know, a division with an ARM has engineered, but it's not too different from the ARM based on the theory. Right? But it fundamentally tries to do the same thing except that it's used to use. Right. And uh, you can sort of stream data and you know, there are some parameters that you can program. But uh, we, we sort of try to qualify the, the framework, the running workloads using this instrument, and it seems to work well for us. And the data that we get out, uh, there's another class of problems we try to represent that data in a useful form, but that's another thing. But at least the scaffolding to use the instrument in a sensible way for workloads, I think, is something we should be using in the working group. We try to sort of uh, arrange for this to be made available soon, and I think we're in a position to do that job, too, so we should have a discussion. All right. Depending on uh, what kind of feedback I get about which uh, microcontroller to use, uh, I'm just uh, this is about the issue perspective. Yeah, I, I, 
if, uh, if possible, I don't know whether you would prefer to do it on uh, the Lenaro Wiki stuff or whether eLinux.org is fine. Uh, either way, I can start a, a wiki page and all the relevant people if you put a little code on there or discussion. Uh, and I can put a checklist of some things that uh, basically the uh, final decisions on. Uh, once I get to that point, uh, I can finalize the schematic. Providing boards for for Lenaro to use, where you can sort of slip in a, you know, put in a little line saying that it would be nice if you can provide reels or sense elements to aid analysis. I mean, this is coming back to not a mandate for a charter. Um, perhaps Kiko, uh, Kiko's in the room. Perhaps he can come. Uh, um, okay, so what's the question? <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> so the question is that uh, I think a lot of people over here trying to highlight the point that you need these sort of sense elements on these boards for the power group to do some sensible analysis. But rather than an engineer carving up the boards and potentially doing something nasty, getting the partners to actually put in these bits, right, in their evaluation board designs. Not immediately, but over a period of time. So we have actually modified a couple of the boards. And just, like, the Exynos is one example where we, we, request, we requested that, they, that, that a change in how the group was done. Um, and they did make the change and send it back to us. Um, I guess one of the questions I have is how much does it require changing in the design itself? How much is this like an easy mod? Or how much is it changing the design? Oh, that, design wise, but, uh, it basically costs you uh, the footprint for a 602 resistor and um, maybe two test points, whether they're through hole or solder pads or what. So design wise, it, it impacts design very, very minimally, very minimally. But it does, of course, if they already have an existing design, it does require spinning the board and changing the layout a little bit. Well, the, like comparably with the XMS change. Uh, I'm sorry. Sorry, I was going to ask you, ask you David, 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 David. Sorry, David, David. sorry. Um, compared to the change that we did on the origin, on the origin. That was on the same origin, that two same shorts and lifted resistor. So, yeah, it's, it's all that old. I'm not aware of, of exactly how they did it, whether they just hacked boards. You saw the board, right? I've got the boards, yeah. Did you see how, it, how it's changed? Okay, it's not obvious. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, so uh, they haven't done the mod that we thought they would do, which is the mod we tried that ended up with this double boot problem. Mm -hmm. um, that said, I only received them on Thursday and I flew out on Friday, so I didn't have a huge amount of time to, to, to investigate. I got, I got one up in the lab. That was really cool. There so might be some origin, it sounds like, in which we could get them to do something we've asked. Since yeah, and, and you know, I, I think they said, yes, we will spin a special version. They, have t they tested that it would do that it would do what it said on the tin, and it does. So, focus on the future of the Yes. Yeah. I mean, so yeah. you go down the that feedback. I, that, but I'm, I'm, I care more about doing like a short term fix, especially because this causes them some pain. Yeah. So next time around when they go and do it again, they'll say, hmm, maybe, maybe we should factor exactly. this into the design. And, and I was just wondering whether if Leonardo could in some way, some practical way, just sort of tell the partners that, you know, maybe as a part of the process followed by the partners well, giving hardware. So, because there's one, one way is this incidental way, which is, hey guys, just do this for us. The other one is just getting the message across that in general it's a good thing to put this in your designs for analysis. Of course, the counter to that is some partners may not be willing to do that because it may expose potentially uh, the lack of so. an, an efficiency. So. Especially because they're missing out on getting you know, just a lot of power testers. So I just worry that unless somebody makes it very explicit and says, hey guys, you should be doing this, you know, then they won't. We, so we, we, we have done that. We have done that with exactly that issue. Mm -hmm. We have said to everybody, at least when you're providing for the validation lab, it has to boot on power on. Not every one of the Agreed. partners is necessarily. Good. It's just a hard message to get through because the teams that are in the, even the teams that were connected to it on Arrow are not necessarily the team. 
close to the teams that are doing the hardware design. So sometimes, yeah. this is why I'm saying that one immediate way of causing them some pain is just getting them, can you actually do a respin or like a hack on the board and then that gets back and you know, that, that ends up reflecting so it's a louder voice inside the company than us saying, this is the recommendation. We could do something like a, like an actual recommendation on how to do boards and so on. Uh, I just don't know what else we would put there. Yeah, there I, I can give you a whole list of, of items that uh, are, are of uh, concern. I mean, if you go and look at a, a wide swath of boards, community boards, low-cost development boards, one of the worst items that you'll find that's almost consistent are missing ground points uh, for testing. Uh, a solid, good, clean test point or connection for your probe to ground. Because if you're probing and working with the board, you, you may have to connect five or six leads that require a ground point. And and <laughs> but that's very consistent. So there are some things, uh, very, very basic things that can be added. And, you know, just notes. If you're doing a new spin or a new design, this is your checklist. Uh, these are things that make it easier for us to validate your board. And yeah. Do you have that somewhere? You no, know, at this stage, it's always just been, you know, just little recommendations. But uh, uh, there. So sure, we could publish them. So. I mean, yeah. and there's literally, like I said, probably 15 that I can name just right off the top bat that are replicated through most of the board designs. Okay. I know one we have, which is push buttons to do the board. Validation line, that's a lot more than the board. You have to get it. Actually, we have some extra GPIOs, and the initial design I did actually included two GPIO buttons. They weren't part of the software design, but they were part of the hardware in case I did want to use it. Just back the file. Okay. So. But uh, from the uh, it, it, it has to be like itself, that's what we the program. Absolutely. So what sort of feedback do you get back in front? Well, most of what I got from the discussions I had with was that most of the people wanted uh, to go with the ARM-based solution uh, for ease of programming, uh, for and clock the speed, the power resolution, uh, and that the, the cost range from anywhere from 60 to $80 range was acceptable in their mind. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I'll uh, create a eLinux uh, wiki page and uh, uh, blast that off, and uh, I'm able to make sure that we get it on the right list and let every know, everybody know. So feedback is very welcome. Please, please let me know, and uh, hopefully we can get you some boards to start tinkering with. Uh, just a note, everything that we'll be doing on this particular board will be open design, open P uh, schematic, open PCB layout. Uh, so anybody that wants to produce it, uh, the Tinkering Tools can do it too. Uh, we hope that you'll buy it from Tin Can Tools, but it'll be an open design for anybody to use. Thank you. Thank you.